we're in the middle of talking about for Orlando. Danny last week talked about a text out of Paul's letter to Timothy, the pastor in Ephesus. I believe one of the last letters Paul wrote, First and Second Timothy. And he said that we are to be rich in good works and ready to be generous. Paul said that because he knows this about Jesus. Jesus taught it's more blessed to give than to receive. And Jesus lived it. Let me show you a key verse in the Gospel of Mark. In fact, it's the theme of the Gospel of Mark. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. To serve, to give. It's exactly what Jesus did. That's what it means to be a Jesus follower. We do what Jesus did. We give. We serve. We talked about giving last week. And I'm, I can't wait for the 13th to be able to give the total because it's still coming in. And I'm, I'm just amazed and I'm so proud to be a part of a church that would take a weekend to say, we're not keeping anything for us. It's all going to help those in our, in our community. And then to meet these prayer partners and these ministry partners and these servants of the Lord that are here today, you're going to get a chance to do that. I'm going to talk about them again in just a moment. So why would we do something called Fort Orlando? Let me give you some reasons. Number one, because Jesus is. You realize he's for Orlando. He loves this city. And he placed you here. Now some of you may not like being here. Some of you may be exiled from another place. Okay? The Lord moved me here from another place as well. But you know what I believe? God places us where we need to be, not where we want to be. I happen to want to be here, but I know there's some I run into, you don't like all the traffic. You know who creates the traffic? You know? People. People who don't know what they're doing. People who need Jesus, just like you, just like me. We're we're, we're as much a contributor as anybody. But man, he's for this city, so shouldn't we be? for this city. Paul said he was a debtor to the Greeks and the Romans, to the Greeks and the barbarians. Man, I just feel like we're in debt to this city. We owe them the love of Christ. Another reason is because everything you have, God gave it to you to be a blessing to somebody. Everything you have, what you drove up here today, your home, every resource God gives so that you can in turn be a blessing to somebody else. And then Probably most important, it's why we were saved in the first place. It's why he called us his own. He saved us so we could make a difference. Let me show you a verse, foundational verse to every person who has followed Christ. We need to understand this, for we are his workmanship. And that word, by the way, it's a beautiful word. It's it's a word for poem. In Greek, it's poema. Sounds like poem. You are his masterpiece. And you were created in Christ Jesus for... A luxurious life in Orlando. That's not what it says, is it? No, you were created for success in every business venture. Nope. You were created for good works. And by the way, he prepared them beforehand. He already knew. That's why he made you the way he did. That's why he moved you to Orlando. It's why he brought you perhaps today. Because he's got something in mind for you. And man, how cool would it be if we find that together and realize that together? And so that's why we're in this. I I grew up in a church that, let me just put it this way. I I didn't like the church. I was not a fan of the church. In fact, I hated the church I was in. Now, you're looking at me strange because my dad was the pastor. (laughs) But that church didn't like my friends because my friends were black. They were my teammates. I had their back and they had my back. But I couldn't bring them to my church. So I had a reason to have a real issue with my church. But my dad said, okay, son, I know you don't want to do this, but if you're going to live under my roof, you have to show up at one service a week. One service. So I began to think, mama's cooking or, no, I'll I'll show up for one service. And so I started coming to one service sitting in the back of the room. Couldn't bring my teammates unless they were white. I brought some of them. 
And we'd just be, I'd be sitting in the back. And let me show you. I can show you exactly how I look. I read body language. I can tell what a person's thinking by their body. Here's the way I would sit in church. I mean, I'm just saying, I dare you to say something to move me. I dare you. And I'd sit there every week. At the end of my high school days, I was about to go off to college. A lady came up to me. She said, David, I just got to tell you, I admire you so much. And I'm thinking, what does she admire me for? She said, I admire you so much because of your faithfulness. I'm looking at her, and this is what's going through my mind. Faithfulness. Lady, I don't even want to be here. And I'm here because I'm hungry, and I want to go, go home and eat. Mama's cooking. And you know what I said to her? Well, thank you, ma'am. Some of us are faithful, and some aren't. I knew enough in the Baptist church, fake it, <laughs> claim it. If they're going to offer it, I'll take it. But you know what it did to me that day? It, it, it planted a seed. So is faithfulness just showing up? Is it just sitting in the room? Now, I want to tell you, I'm, I, I love it when you come and show up. And by the way, if I start coughing, it's not my allergies. It's because I was at the UCF game last night when we beat Cincinnati, and some of those guys are sitting right there. And, you know, they had a long night, but they're here, and they're here every weekend when they don't have an away game. I love it when people show up here. But I'm not going to tell you, oh, it's enough just to sit in a seat. No. Faithfulness is not just showing up. Belief is a verb. Faith is something we do, and it's so much bigger than that. And so we are driven by faith, and Love Orlando is all about living that faith out in this city. So if you've got a Bible, I want you to go to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, one of the, one of the greatest books written by the brother of our Lord. James was the brother, half-brother, if, if you want to say that of our Lord. And he writes to the Christians who were going through a lot, by the way. And this is what he says to them. I'm going to start in chapter 2. So if you're on the stream, you got a way to get it open and get it in front of you. Chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he doesn't have works? Can that faith actually save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, be filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works Paul, I mean, uh, James is actually saying, uh, there's no way to prove your faith if you don't do anything. How are you going to show it? You do something, and that's what lets people know you have faith. And then he says, you believe that God is one? Oh, good for you. You've made it to the level of demons. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Now, let's just stop there for a moment. I need to give you a little bit of a preface here. A lot of people think James is saying we get saved by doing good works. And, and, and it always comes up in theological debates. It's a false narrative, people. He's not saying we get saved by works. In fact, let me show you. There's this debate out there among theologians who don't have anything else to do. And they believe Paul is on one side, James is on the other. And they're fighting each other. No, they're not fighting each other. Let me show you exactly what's happening. So if over here is when you, get, when you are born, right? You become human here, all right? You're on this earth living, and all of a sudden, you get to a point in your life where you realize your need for Jesus. That's the line right here. And you receive Jesus. You put your faith in him, and by grace and by faith, you're saved. And then you keep going as a believer follower 
of Jesus. Paul is standing right here with the line behind him, and he's looking at everyone coming to that line saying, you're not going to get here by doing good stuff. You're not going to get here by all the works you do. There's only one way to get to this line, and that's by the grace of God. Because none of us are good enough to earn being able to cross this line. It's always the work of the Spirit and the work of grace that brings us to the moment of conversion. Okay, so Paul's here. He's fighting all those enemies that are talking about being saved by works. James is back-to-back with Paul. He's talking about after you're saved, those who do nothing. And he's saying, you got to be kidding me. The king of the universe just walked in your life, and you're not going to be changed? You're not going to live like him? So what he's saying is, no, you didn't cross that line. You don't really have faith, because if you had faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave his life for us, it will show up in your life. So see, they're back to back. And they're talking about two different things. So, what does James tell us? Number one, it's not about what we say. You can say I'm a Christian all day. You can say I love Orlando. I'm for Orlando. Put it on your bumper sticker. Wear the t-shirts. I I guess I didn't give enough last weekend because I didn't get a black t-shirt like everybody else. But I'm working on it. No, seriously, you can wear the stuff. But guys, it's not about what we say. We have been the voice and the mouth of Jesus for a long time. It's time to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. It's time to show this city we are following Jesus Christ. So it's not just what we say. Remember when Jesus told the parable about the master who awarded the servant these words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. All of us want to hear that one day. Did you, did you listen to what the word is? Well done, not well said, thy good and faithful servant. Oh, we got a lot of sayers. Go on social media. Got a lot of sayers. Words don't impress. Action does. My grandmother taught me when I was a little boy, pretty is as pretty does. And if you're a follower of Christ, the world's going to see it. And they're going to know. Even Jesus, when he talked about that final judgment... In Matthew 25, when he says there's going to be a division of the sheep and goats, and and those who are on the sheep side, those are his, and he's saying, come on with me, we're going to heaven together. And those who are on the other side, depart from me. I never knew you. you. Do you know the way he divided them? To the group on the right, the sheep, he said, hey, when I was in prison, you visited me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. And he said, those on, the, on that side are going, wait, what? We never saw you in prison. We didn't know you were hungry. And then he says these words, in as much as you did it to the least of these, you did it for me. What's interesting, and then he says to the other group, the opposite. What's interesting is that final judgment scene that Jesus taught us never mentions one thing they said. He just talks about what they did. And so for me, faith is not about what I say. I say a lot, all the time. Even when there's nothing left to be said, I'm still saying it. I mean, that's just me, okay? And it's not about what we believe. Guys, I love theology. I spent a lot of time studying theology. I have a Ph.D. from a wonderful seminary. But to believe something and do nothing is the wrong theology. It didn't come from this book. That's not what you read when you read this book. So for those, and again, he uses this. He goes, hey, um, some of you say you believe in God, and you believe God is one. And James goes, good for you. Let me applaud you. You're right where the demons are. Did you know there's not an atheist among the demons? Did you know there's not even an agnostic among the demons? Demons are theists. They believe in a God. They know there's a God. And the word, this is so cool, this word, the demons believe, and what do they do? Shudder. That is actually a word for worship. Let me tell you, every demon knows who he is. And every demon knew who Jesus was when he was born at Bethlehem. And they knew 
He is the Son of God. So for us to say, well, I believe, and I believe in God, and I believe in Jesus, that's it. I've done everything I need to do. Wrong. There is so much more. Even James uses that blessing, that Hebrew blessing. Be warm, be filled, go in peace. Go back to that, that verse and put that up. If you say to them, go in peace, be warm, be filled, that's a, that's a beautiful blessing, by the way. It's, it's a true Hebrew blessing. But you don't do anything? It doesn't matter what theology you have. It doesn't matter what you believe about him. You did nothing. So it's not just about what we believe. You know, I'm beginning to believe that believers believe something about Jesus. Followers do what Jesus did. I want to be a follower. I want my belief system to change the way I live every day. And so that's what James is trying to say. Let me give you an example. When you know of something to do, when God puts something in your heart to do, what do you do with it? Do you act on it? I just think we do. I think we should. So we had some pastors that were going out to a, a meeting, and we weren't going to be very far from Uvalde, Texas. And I, uh, I went to Danny and said, Danny, I, I don't know why, I've just got a crazy thought. The Lord impressed upon me to go and minister there and do something in the city of Uvalde, especially to that, those parents and that fam those families of those children that were killed at Robb Elementary. And I just, we started bouncing around some ideas, so let me tell you what we did about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. We went to Uvalde, Texas. We took a check from this church that you made possible because of your generous giving. And we went to a church that we knew was in the middle of ministry to all those broken families, and we delivered that check. They didn't know us from anything. We just said, hey, we're, we're from First Baptist Orlando. We know what it's like to lose people in your community to violence and to hate and to evil. And we want to be a blessing to you and help you with some of the expenses that you've incurred because we went through the same thing. We hand them a check. I wish you could have seen that moment. They just, they received it, but it was like, wow, why would y'all do this? And then we went to Robb Elementary. I just said, can we go to the school? Now, it's closed. They don't have, obviously, any students there today. Look at this. This was just two weeks ago. Nineteen students, two teachers. And even a teacher's husband died of a heart attack because of the trauma and the stress of all this. I wasn't prepared for that. Every one of us, we just walked around in silence. In fact, there's a picture of us standing there. There's a young lady that um, her mom and her family honored her. I love that sign, kids, kids' lives matter too. So here we are. You see this guy right here? None of your pastors have a ponytail. He walked up. In fact, I looked up and I saw this guy getting out of a truck. Older gentleman. About my age. He walked up and, and he said, hey, I saw some activity down here. Are y'all, what are y'all doing? I said, man, we just came to pray for families. We're from Orlando, Florida. We had a shooting in our community and it's a horrible season for a city to go through something like that, and we just wanted to pray. You're not going to believe who this guy was. He was a grandfather. He said, my little granddaughter's name is on one of those crosses. And he said, I, I haven't been down here in a long time, but I saw activity. <laughs> only, only God can do this. He looked at us and said, today's my birthday. And he said, I can tell you the first one to crawl up in my lap to wish me happy birthday would have been my granddaughter. And this is the first birthday. She's not going to be there. Man, we prayed around him. We prayed for them. Now, I'm telling you this just simply because I don't know sometimes what to do. But I just know my faith requires me to do something. And so when God speaks to me, when God leads, do it. 
And so when you get into this text in James, he lays out really the way that we're supposed to live our life. I'll give you three phrases. Number one, be compassionate in generosity. Be compassionate. You walk by somebody in need, how do you not do anything? How do you not do anything? That's what he's saying. Don't give them a blessing. You can give them a blessing, but do something to try to help them. And let me give you one reason you ought to live that way. Because everything you have that they don't belongs to him. Everything that you have that they don't, whatever that person is, sitting on the side of the street or whatever, guess where you got it? You got it from the Lord. It's not yours. It all belongs to him. And so God just says, I want you to take care of my people. I want you to use what I've given you. It's all his. Every time I travel, I was in Haiti once, and we walked through water after the earthquakes to get some supplies to a village, and, and we were with new tribes. I, I just, I mean, new missions. I was just so moved by what I saw. I had this little box, and it had toothbrushes and stuff like that in it, hygiene kind of stuff. And we walked in, and we got to this village, and all of a sudden, everybody started running out. Kids started running out. They didn't have any clothes. This little girl ran up to me. She was probably six, seven years old. She ran up to me, and she sees that box, and she's just staring at it. And I just handed it to her. When our eyes met, this is what went through my mind. How come I wasn't born here? How come that's not my daughter? I didn't have anything to do with where I was born. Did you? Did y'all get to pre-select? Anybody in here? You realize how good God has been to us? So how dare we act arrogant like we don't owe anybody anything? Yes, we do, children of God. Yes, we do. God has blessed us so we can be a blessing. The second phrase is, be sacrificially obedient. In other words, when God speaks, do something and, and be sacrificial. Not just a little tip, just a little, well, I'm going to do a little bit. So, I, No, no, no. Read what he says. I'm back in the text. Go back to verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, he used Abraham as a classic example. Abraham gave the promised child up. Okay, he offered up Isaac. You remember Abraham, the father of the Jews, the father of many nations. Back in Genesis, he's chosen by God. And his name was Abram at first. Then it was changed to Abraham, meaning plural, father of nations. And God called him righteous. And then God said, hey, I want you to offer up the promised child, the child through whom God is going to bless the nations. And what Abraham do? He said, all right, I'll do it. He goes up on a mountain. It's called Mount Moriah. It's actually the mountain where the temple sits today. You say, what temple? Well, there's a mosque sitting there, but it's where the temple sat. Okay? Abraham offered up his precious, precious child. God spared him. Oh, Abraham passed the test of obedience, but he was sacrificial in it. Now, here's what Paul, I mean, here's what James is trying to say. Why did he do that? Because he's righteous. Because he's righteous, because God had changed his life. There are people who think James is trying to say, well, that day he was made righteous. Nope, hang on. Boys and girls, let's go back to math. He is declared righteous in Genesis 15. You got me? Genesis 15. This moment happens when he offers up Isaac in Genesis 22. So, boys and girls, which comes first, 15 or 22? The reason Abraham offered up that which was dearest is because he was a righteous man. That's what righteous people do. 
That's what people do when your life is changed. When God asks for something, you offer it up. And by the way, you have an Isaac. We all do. Something we don't want to offer to the Lord. Could be a relationship, could be a career, could be a profession, could be our time. I mean, I know people that, hey, they'll write a check any day, but I'm not, I'm not getting involved in helping all that stuff. Or I, I'll, just, I'll just go down there, but I'm not giving anything. We all have our Isaacs. But I'm telling you, because of our faith and because of what he's done for us, we will be sacrificial in that obedience. And then the third phrase, take risk. Take risk. I wish I could tell you that there's never a risk. When you help somebody, it's going to change their life, and they're going to turn into Billy Graham. Nope, not going to happen. Well, I gave some money to this guy at 7-Eleven the other day, and, you know, David, I, I started to give it to him, but I just thought, you know what? If I give money to him, he's going to go buy some more liquor, going to buy drugs, and I'm just not going to be a part of that. Don't worry about obedience for that man. You be obedient to what God's telling you to do. That man will give an account, or that woman will give an account. You will give an account with what God said do. If God tells you to do it, do it. And know, you know who he uses as an example? Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute. Rahab wasn't even a Hebrew. So here you got James, the brother of our Lord, leader of the church in Jerusalem, and he's saying, guys, we ought to live like this. Abraham and the Jews are going, yes, yes. Rahab, and they're going, what? You know why he uses Rahab? Because she risked everything. Go back to the text with me. Jump back in in verse 24, or excuse me, 25. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messenger, sent him out by another way. As the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Who was Rahab? Rahab lived in a city called Jericho. Rahab was an unbeliever. Rahab basically was what would have been probably most likely a Canaanite. And now all of a sudden Joshua is leading the children of Israel. They cross the, the river Jordan and they're coming in and they're going to have to fight battles. And Jericho's the city where they marched around it and the walls fell and all that. God is bringing them to the promised land. But before they went in, they sent spies. Joshua went sent spies. Well, guess where those spies ended up? At the home of a prostitute. Now, don't connect the dots on that. There's a reason they ended up there. Rahab had already heard of Yahweh. According to Joshua chapter 2, we know Rahab had already heard of Yahweh and already believed in Yahweh. And it just so happened, those spies ended up at her place. Now, how coincidental is that and when they met with her she tells them I believe in your God his fame has spread through this land and so basically they made a deal I'm not going to tell anybody you're here and I'm going to give you a way out and by the way when you come and take this city would you please spare me and they made the deal with the scarlet cord out the window I mean it all worked exactly the way God wanted to so why does he use her because she risked everything. You realize if they had caught those spies there, she's dead. She's executed. She didn't care. You know why? Because she believed in Yahweh. She believed in God. And it was that belief that made her take risk. And so for us, it's going to be a risk. You're going to be asked to do things you're not comfortable with. You're going to be serving in places you're like, man, I've never been here before. It's okay. Remember Simon Peter sitting in the boat with the disciples, and he looks up, and he sees somebody walking on the water, and he goes, wait a minute, that's Jesus. And he says, if that's you, Jesus, tell me to come to you. And Jesus said, come. So Peter's got to make a decision. Do I risk going under? And Peter said, yep, it's worth it. He gets out of the boat. By the way, how many disciples do you think were in that boat? If the numbers hold, there were 12. How many got out? One. That's how the statistics go, people stepping out to serve. It's miserable in the church today. There's a number that says 50% of Christians asked about serving said they never intend to serve 
anywhere. God help us. Peter got out. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Between me and you, you know where the safest place is? Doing what I did my senior year in high school, sit. Don't ever do anything. This is safest. If you include safety, meaning you're not asked to be uncomfortable. But see, I think safety is more about being in the center of God's will. There's no place safer than in the center of God's will. And I don't mean just physically safe. I mean just safe. Hey, the safest place for a ship, where is it? These big ships, these cruise ships, where's the safest place to keep them? In the port. In the harbor. They don't build ships to sit in a port. What about a plane? Where's the safest place for a plane, an airplane? In a hangar. You don't build planes to put them in a hangar. You build them to fly. You build ships to sail. And you weren't saved to sit. You were saved to serve. This is what I want you to remember. And some of you are going, you know, I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure what that's about. Are you willing to serve with us? Man, that would be awesome. Because it might help you understand what it means to give your life to Jesus when you watch someone who is following Christ. We just believe that that's the reason. He changed us. It's so we could serve somebody else. And I can't give you assurance that where you go and what you do, there's going to be results. Okay? I can promise you this, though. I was sitting just thinking about this this week. This is what the Lord said to me. This came directly from the Lord about my serving. My serving doesn't always produce results in others, but it does in me. You know, I realize I'm not crazy enough to think that when I stand here on the weekends and preach, there are weekends not everybody's life has changed. I know there are weekends that just, well, maybe one or two might have said, I'm going to do that or I'm going to do that. Guys, can I just tell you, I've never stood here and preached in obedience that my life wasn't changed that day. When you serve, Your life will be changed. And who knows, you may be a blessing to somebody else. I read an article last night. I've seen several that say recent studies tell us that people who regularly or consistently serve others are less likely to be depressed and have more peace in their life. Wow, finally science is figuring it out. God's known it all along. I'm telling you, it will change your life. And you know what? It could change somebody else's. Can I show you what happened to our staff? We had a staff serve day. And, and they went, I, I say they, Kimo Sabi. I wasn't here. So I, this is all the glory going to our staff. We got an amazing staff. They went and served. Here's one of the projects. They showed up and they had to fill these planter boxes with dirt and they got the dirt, from, there's where they got the dirt, with a wheelbarrow. And then they had to plant some stuff. And they didn't know, what, is it going to grow? Is it going to work? I mean, this is just a real practical example. Well, guess what? Last week, the Orlando Rescue Mission showed us this picture. There it is. Isn't that awesome? Hey, it worked. I'm telling you, when you sow those seeds, you don't know what God's going to do with that. It could change somebody's life forever. So let me just close with this. Jesus was asked a question by a lawyer one day. The lawyer said, hey, what's the most important command? And Jesus thought about it and said, "Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Being a typical attorney, he goes, well, who is our neighbor? In other words, what's the definition of neighbor? Sounds like our world, doesn't it? Jesus said, all right, let me tell you a story. He said, there was a man going down the road to to Jericho from Jerusalem, and he was beaten up, left for dead on the side of the road. And then along comes a priest. So here's a guy laying, beaten up, dead, I mean, just about to die, and here comes a priest. 
What does the priest do? He sees him and goes, oh my goodness, my heart is touched. I've got to be generous in my compassion and compassion in my generosity and I've got to help this guy. Nope. Priest did this. Walked on the other side of the road. Then another man came by, a Levite. By the way, that's in the same family. In other words, those are the preachers and the people who have all reason to help somebody because they're religious. He comes up, sees the guy, and goes, "Mm -mm, I'm not getting involved in that. He walks over here. Then comes a Samaritan, the lowest of people, according to the Jews. They weren't even fully Hebrew. They're not. They're half-breeds. What does that Samaritan do? Sees him, has compassion, comes over, binds up his wounds, helps him, and then takes him to an inn. And says to the innkeeper, hey, I've done everything I can. I want you to take care of him. I'm going to give you some money. And I'm going to be back later. And if, if, if you need more money, I'll pay for anything you spend on him. I want you to take care of him. By the way, folks, our friends back here, they're the innkeepers. They're the folks that come alongside us, that help us. They're the ones we can say, hey, we're not sure what to do, but can you guys help us? Yes, they can help us. That's exactly how the story played out. So when Jesus finishes that story, he looks at the lawyer and says, which one showed more mercy? The religious guys or a Samaritan? And the lawyer said rightly, Samaritan. And I just want you to see the last words of Jesus in that parable. Look at this. Go and do likewise. That's what he's saying to us today. Go do likewise. Let's be a follower of Jesus. So, I know you're thinking that I don't know what to do in every situation. Neither do I. Well, I can't help everybody. I know that. I know the feelings. So, Rachel and I had pizza one night on Sand Lake. And we came out. (laughs) And um, pizza sounds good right now, doesn't it? And we came out, and, and there was this guy standing there, and I, I figured he was looking for help. And I just went over to him and said, hey, man, you all right? He said, yeah, I'm, I'm just needing some help. Can you, can you help me? My girlfriend and I lived under that bridge over there on I-4 uh, last night. And it was rainy and cold. And uh, he said, we just need a little help. And I said, uh, yeah, is your girlfriend with you? And he said, yes, yeah, she's over there. And I saw her, and I said, hey, I tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive over. I'll meet you over there. So I jump in the truck, and I look at my wife and say, hey, this guy needs help. He and his girlfriend are homeless, and what do you think? I want to maybe do something. I knew the answer before I ever asked her. Guys, I married the most compassionate, generous person in the world. She loves helping people in need. I mean, she married me. Come on, that's probably a great testimony for her, right? And, and she said, yeah, let's get them. And so I go over, and we pick them up. We put them, they got in the back of the truck. I mean, back seat, not the back of the truck. <laughs> got to clarify here. They got in the back seat. So I said, hey, man, how long y'all been together? He said, well, we've been together a long time. We came from Jacksonville. And uh, we ended up down here, and we lost everything. And we just, we just really don't know where to turn. I said, well, I want to do something for you. In my mind, I'm going, gosh, do I put them in one room? Or two rooms at the hotel. I wanted to put them up. There's a Drury Inn right there on the interstate. So I'm kind of debating, you know, one room, two, whatever. I look at him and I say, hey, y'all love each other? Yeah. Why aren't y'all married? I'd have never been able to give, I would have never guessed this answer. He said, David, when you're homeless, you often lose all your identity. And we don't even have an ID. We don't even have a driver's license. We can't get a marriage license. I said, well, do you all want to be married? Yes. I said, tell you what I'm going to do. Rachel and I are going to put you in a room tonight. And tomorrow I'm going to have somebody pick you up, and you're coming down to our church, and we're going to have a wedding. And he said, you would do that? I said, yes, sir, I will do that. He said, well, what about we can't get a license? I said, we'll let the state of Florida worry about that later. We are going to do it right in the sight of God. Okay? Let's honor him first. So, I checked them in. 
I checked him in the hotel, and the guy checking him in, he looked at me and goes, I've been to your church. I said, really? He said, he said what are you doing? I said, I'm helping a couple. He said, that's so much what y'all are about. He said, I'm honored to help you. I told the couple, I got your room. Brought them the room key. <laughs> this is what I told them. Y'all going to kill me for this. I said, look, this is a special night. It's the night before you get married. Put pillows down the middle of the bed, okay? <laughs> Just put them down the middle of the bed. I don't want you crossing that pillow that way, or he doesn't need to cross that way. And they laughed. I said, you do whatever, but I'm... I'm Put the pillows down. And they showed up in my office the next morning. And they were so excited. I had an assistant that was kind of filling in at the time. And she was so overwhelmed. I saw her talking to the girl and they're weeping. I'm, I said, what's, what's wrong? What's going on? And my assistant was giving that girl her ring. I said, what ring did you give her? It's a promise ring that she had had since a teenager. And she got married, and she still wore that ring. And she gave it to that girl. Man, we did, I did that wedding and pronounced him husband and wife, and it was so cool. And then two years later, I talked to that assistant this week. Two years later, they showed up at the pregnancy center. She was pregnant. They were going to have a baby. And they went there to get help and supplies. And as soon as they walked in, this assistant, this young lady that gave her a ring, the girl saw her and said, oh, my goodness. And she held up her hand and said, look, I still got it. I still got your ring. Now, let me fill in the missing piece. I don't know how to get an ID. I know how to do weddings. I don't know how to get an ID. But you know who I called? Idignity. And they took that couple, and they walked them through. They got their ID back. They got their life back. And we got a great partner in our dignity. I just can't tell you what it means to have that. So here's what I want to close with. Here's a thought. You can't do everything for everyone. But you can do something for someone. Let's do something for someone. Why? Because we are for Orlando. Hey, I want you to pray with me. Father, you just got to help us. We sometimes want to do it, but we don't know what to do. But today, we got people here to help us. We got partners that are so good at it. So God, give us the courage to go have a conversation and to make a difference, to show this city we are for Orlando. In Jesus' name, amen. Danny, tell us what we need to do, ma'am. Hey, so let me give you the instructions. Our partners are going to be in the center lobby as soon as we dismiss today. And here's what you need. There are two simple ways you can do it. You can go to the center lobby and talk to them. Uh, they'll help you sign up. Or you can simply go to fororlando.com. Go to fororlando.com or text the word SERVE to 40777. I think we've got a QR code as well. It'll take you to the website. When you get to the website, you'll get all the information you need to sign up. So here's the way it works. You pick a category. These categories are available. You pick one of those. Then you pick a partner. Uh, once you pick the partner, it'll ask you the level of involvement that you want. It could be meeting a need, like supplying something for them, all the way to being involved on a regular basis with that partner. And then you sign up. It'll give you the information. You submit your name. They got me signed up there. Submit your name, and you want to do it for each person so we have a way of knowing who has signed up to serve. We want to help you do it. They're friendly people with four Orlando shirts on in the back. They can help you as well. Let's overwhelm our partners in our city with serving. Go and do likewise is what Jesus said, and that's what we're going to do today. Thank you for being here. We'll see you back next week, and have a great week. <laughs>